All right, it is great to be back. Hopefully you listened to the bonus episode when I explained that I was taking a little bit of a break while I was quote unquote lifing. However, it is absolutely great to be back. A lot of news has broken. A lot of developments have taken place while I was away. But overall, the last few weeks, months, this year entirely was just absolutely amazing, both in a good way and a bad way. So over the next couple of episodes, we're going to be discussing certain things. Of course, the predictions that I made coming into 2022, what we're going to look forward to in 2023, and of course, where I was right and where I was wrong. But today we're going to cover the 10 most valuable lessons that I learned about Web3 in 2022. Hello, I'm Taj, digitally known as Tropic Vibes, the host of Nifty Business, where we highlight NFTs and explore Web 3.0 as we move from pure speculation to creating real world value. So we're going to cover, of course, crypto, NFTs and how it all ties together for businesses. Well, the first lesson that I learned was that algorithmically backed is not backed at all. And this lesson came from the whole Luna fiasco, how everything collapsed there and really just sent shockwaves to this entire industry. And that was really the start of the avalanche. I mean, we were already going into a bear market before that event, but that definitely just turned everything upside down. And if you're not familiar with the whole Luna collapse, well, Long story short, as a part of all of that ecosystem, there was a stable coin, UST, and it was supposedly algorithmically blocked, algorithmically backed, tongue twister right there. But long story short, basically the code, the smart contract was supposed to keep it pegged at one US dollar by trading and selling off other assets such as Bitcoin. And long story short, it looks great on paper. It sounds like a great thing. However, it just does not work. Every single iteration of this sort of stable coin has failed and this one definitely was a complete disaster and wealth really just evaporated tens of billions of dollars overnight just disappeared at least in net worth because of course the value of these tokens go up and down and of course it's not like cash is literally disappearing but the value was wiped off of the books so when we're talking about a stable coin or something that is pegged to a u.s dollar understanding what is backing that asset is it actual u.s dollars is it Bitcoin, what exactly is it that is giving it value? It's sort of like back in the day, well before we were alive, at least most of us that would be listening to this podcast anyways, dollars were backed by gold. So in theory that you knew you could always trade in those dollars and get gold out of the reserve. So what is backing these stable coins? Why are they pegged to a dollar? What really gives it its value? We now know, in case we didn't know coming into this year, that algorithms cannot back a coin. So going forward, I don't think that is something that we're going to hear ever again. I think people have been burned enough. And this one was just so public, so huge that I don't think we're ever going back to that. And as a result, a lot of things started to collapse. So that brings us to point number two, which is if it's not your keys, it is not your crypto. This is something that I've heard from crypto guys from before. I didn't really fully understand it. But watching all of these companies that were affected by the whole Luna collapse, Celsius and Voyager and of course exchanges and multiple companies that had people's funds. Well, once it was insolvent, meaning that they couldn't give people back their money because it was all propped up by the value of these tokens that came crashing down with Luna, well, then people could not make their withdrawals. So it's very similar to you hear about bank runs during the Great Depression when everyone's trying to run to the bank to take out their money. However, the money is not there. And this was before the days when the FDIC in the US anyways was federally guaranteed guaranteeing these with an insurance, making sure that people up to a certain amount would be able to get their funds. Well, that was exactly what happened then. The banks ran out of money because, of course, the value just was not there and banks were being shut and people were just out of their money. And that's basically what happened in the crypto world, the equivalent of that. So if you did not have crypto in your own private wallet, such as your ledger or your Trezor or even a MetaMask, well, anything that was off of an exchange, basically, where you had those keys, it was not yours. So those funds could be locked, whether it is a government seizing that or it's just bankruptcy in the sense that they tie everything up, as we've recently seen with SBF going for bankruptcy with FTX and multiple companies even before that, once these funds are tied up for whatever reason, customers cannot get them and it's just a total disaster. So I think everyone that did not know that before now knows that. And number three, of course, where I spend most of my time, my passion in this space is with NFTs and the technology that is 
going to have so much development in the future and I'm more bullish on it than ever before. But the number one thing that I would say that we learned in this year is that NFTs in itself are not a product. So last year, of course, with these PFP crazes and everything, people were just investing into these NFTs as if the NFT themselves had value. However, it is much more like the traditional stock market than we even realize. Well, just because it is on the stock market or it is being sold does not mean that there's actually value behind those shares. And that is very similar to how these NFTs are. Just because the technology is there and you can sell these non-fungible token regardless of how the art might look, especially with the whole PFP generative art craze, they don't even necessarily hold the same value as a one-of-one -one artist. But the tokens itself, the novelty of it really came to light saying that, well, that is not where the value is. What is actually backing? And that's when the whole utility word came out and everyone was saying, well, what is this actually representing? What do you get from it? The benefits. And of course, people are pushing the community and so forth. But at the end of the day, we quickly learned that, you know what, just because it is an NFT it might be just an amazing image, regardless of how it was generated or created. Well, what exactly are people buying? And going forward, we're going to use this technology in very much more user friendly ways that we've even seen. I've covered Starbucks and multiple other companies that are not even calling them NFTs, but they're using blockchain technology and they are non fungible tokens. However, on the front end, the user side of things. They're not even mentioning that because the real value is actually not in the NFT itself, the technology. The value is in the loyalty rewards program or whatever it is that benefit that the user or the owner is going to get from it. And I think going forward, we're going to really phase out the jargon about which blockchain and all that stuff. This is something I spoke about before, but generally speaking, now we know more than ever, anyone that has been in this space for more than six months should know that the NFT itself is not the product. And any project that is just banking on selling NFTs as if that is their main source of revenue is in serious trouble because that is not the product. That is not what you're selling. That is just the means by which ownership is transferred and rights and access is unlocked. Number four is that games must be fun because NiftyFi and this whole Web3 gaming and play to earn, that was something that was very big coming into this year. And we saw that a lot of projects were launching these NFTs with the promise of being able to make full-time income playing games and what have you, earning tokens and so forth. Well, here's the problem. Most of those games were just not fun. And this whole play to earn model and everything really fell apart quickly. Really by mid-year, people stopped saying that and it was play and earn and they were doing different things, learn and earn and everything. But the whole play to earn promise absolutely fell apart. And it was mainly because these games were just not fun. People were literally going on to these things just to get the tokens. And it was like working a job. It was a chore. So if nothing else going forward, I don't think there is a death sentence for gaming on the blockchain. I think we're at its infancy and we're really going in that direction. But the whole pitch, the whole promise of quitting your job and playing video games on your phone, getting a full-time income, still paying your rent or your mortgage or whatever, well, that promise was not delivered. And now more game developers are coming into the space rather than blockchain folks that are trying to develop games and uh, fulfill all these promises. And I think it's going to work a lot better with game developers that are actually in the space using the technology to make some fun games. And however that play to earn model and all that stuff that might come down the line will come in. It's going to be a much different thing than what we saw in 2020 and 2021, because it definitely did not deliver those promises in 2022 like we thought it was going to. Number five, going back to all the craziness that we're seeing with not just the gaming side of things, things, but also with the financial side of things, regulation is definitely coming in so many different ways because this one really touches every single area of Web3, whether it is actually the censorship on these blockchains or whatever it might be, uh, whichever countries they're operating in and how they're actually locking funds in, how they're being sold to the public. I mean, every possible way that you can think of. Regulators had a dream year. They were able to see the collapses of all of these major companies, people's funds, the consumers were just taken advantage of. They lost money, whether it be influencers that were pitching things to them or these massive companies like FTX and Celsius and Luna and just huge ecosystems just wiped off the face of the map as far as people's wealth, their income, hard earned income. So because of that, it really opened up the door for regulators to come in. And of course, the institutional money, the hedge funds and the investors, people that might be managing pensions and so forth, they want this because they're not going to necessarily put these monies at risk anymore, knowing what could possibly happen because with that regulation, they're not exactly sure what 
what laws these things are operating under and so forth. So they're going to push for regulation more than anything. And if nothing else, Sam Bankman Fried, what he was able to accomplish with FTX, he was pushing for regulation, but crashing everything the way it crashed. Well, it definitely going to open up the door for that because people are more loud about that than ever before. Of course, the eye was always on crypto in general. The government's wanting CBDCs and so forth. And of course, the whole thing about control and where the people have access to quote unquote sound money and all this crazy stuff was always at the forefront. But regulators are coming. The regulators are basically undeniable right now. A lot of people are living in a fantasy land saying that there will never be regulation in this space and so forth. But trust me, it is coming. The writing is on the wall. I'm expecting some major legislation in many countries around the world coming very soon. And with all of this, as far as businesses being in the space, one thing that was learned, I would say this would be lesson number six, is that fiat is definitely needed for a business because at the end of the day, electric bills, taxes, all of these things are going to be paid in euros, pounds, dollars, whatever country that you're in. And it's not like you're going to be paying them in Bitcoin or ETH or Solana. God forbid your project launched on Solana and you're generating all of your funds and keeping it in Solana. And then everything just crashed down from $250 to $8. Well, if you had to pay a massive bill, let's say a mortgage or taxes, you know, that is a huge hit. You could literally wipe out your entire book because if you did not convert that to a stable coin or a local currency at that time after the mint or after the sale, well, then that was a huge problem. As much as we love to say that this whole crypto thing is just amazing and ETH and Bitcoin and decentralization and all that stuff, and uh, we just love the volatility. Of course, if you're a degen, you're trying to make a profit on all this stuff. But as a business, someone who is has stable expenses, that is the worst thing possible. You do not want such a volatile currency. And and even if you're selling things and you're accepting that as payment, getting it back into fiat or stable coin or something of that nature is just absolutely key. And that was something that was just very evident as we went into this bear market. And it's just very different climate than a bull market altogether. So that is lesson number eight is, first of all, just be very careful who you're listening to because the loudest people in a bull market are probably the people that you should not be listening to. And the main lesson is heroes live long enough to become villains. We saw this with just countless actors. I'm not even going to call their names. You just know all the craziness that went down this year, whether it's celebrities, influencers, major companies that were ran by the CEOs or chairmen, uh, chairman of the boards, even uh, some of these uh, marketplaces that were hit with in insider trading. There was just so much that went down, the long list of people that went from being the most popular person on Twitter one minute to basically being the butt of everyone's jokes, being made fun of and the centerpieces of memes very quickly. And it's because hubris sets in, people become arrogant, they take these huge risks, and of course greed sets in. And guess what? Those same heroes that were championed, whether it be the companies or the individuals, they live long enough to become the villains and is very unfortunate. So it's never a good thing to have someone up on a pedestal thinking that they're so perfect and flawless and not really holding them to the same standards as a normal person or a normal company. Just being realistic with expectations, I think was something that was really learned during this year. And so many people were on such a high horse, even criticizing other people in the industry. And guess what? They fell victim to the same things that they were criticizing. And well, now it's a level playing field, a lot of those quote unquote messiah type of figures that were in the space have fallen by the wayside. And speaking of greed, lesson number nine, real yields are absolutely boring in the sense of the, when, when people are hearing 7% in the stock market or they're hearing one or two percent in some high yield savings account. Well, that sounds absolutely horrible, especially in comparison to inflation and what have you. But when DeFi is talking about hundred percent, two thousand percent, just some crazy numbers like that, and what we see that is very attractive. It brings in a lot of people. They pull out their savings, they empty out their four hundred one ks and IRAs and all sorts of things, and they come into DeFi and they get absolutely wrecked when things go wrong. Is because those interest are very unsustainable. It's just unrealistic. And even on paper, when you see something is yielding seven or 8%, it's going to double 
every seven years, if my math is correct, that is like what the stock market is averaging. So if something is offering something like a 2,000% interest rate, well, you know, that is something that's going to be doubling at a ridiculous and unsustainable rate, and not enough people are coming into this space. So it's almost like the word that I absolutely hate using, but I have to throw it in here, is like a Ponzi scheme. It's depending on people coming in to keep paying that out, and it falls apart very quickly. A Ponzi scheme never works. And that's what a lot of DeFi had turned into. I'm not saying DeFi is like that because there's some great DeFi projects and I have nothing wrong with DeFi. In fact, I prefer DeFi over CeFi. And if you really look at some solid DeFi projects, they've actually held strong through this whole thing. But those were the ones that were ignored because the guess what? The real yields are boring. In the bull market, when people are making 30% in the day, well, hearing something is making five, six, seven, eight percent, which is way better than anything that you're gonna get in traditional finance. It's frowned upon when people are just making just extravagant, exuberant funds. And that is why people were just drawn in through this whole greed, FOMO trap and what have you. And now we're going back to the place where those 7%, those 8%, those seem pretty amazing right now, right? So it is a completely different world. And I think if I had just massive amounts of discretionary funds to throw into some of these, maybe I would have gotten burned, but maybe it was a good thing that I was tying up a lot of my funds into NFTs, which trust me, didn't all work out. However, I was fortunate not to just get suckered into these yield things, but I was doing a lot of research trying to figure out how these things are working, and I just couldn't really wrap my head around it, whatever, but I didn't necessarily think they were a Ponzi scheme. I thought I just wasn't smart enough to figure out the math, but guess what? It turns out that most of them were Ponzi schemes. It was just hidden behind the tech, which is a good time to segue into number nine is that Bitcoin is king. I know Bitcoin, the oldest crypto, the granddaddy of them all is pretty boring. Uh, the price is very high. People are not excited about it, but I can definitely say I was not someone that was anywhere near a maxi or anything. I still wouldn't consider myself to be a maxi. But as this year went on, the case for maxis became very strong. And if you're interested in just understanding why Bitcoin is such an amazing option, great book out there is called Bitcoin Standard. I usually have it in the show notes on the footer. And, you know, it's there on Amazon. You can listen to it in audio format via Audible or wherever it is, ebooks. And it's just a great history of money and currencies and why Bitcoin is just so amazing. And the fact that really it has not changed since its inception. It is quote unquote so archaic because they can't do these lightning changes and just, you know, the consensus of the whole decentralized network to switch over to make some massive change. And that is the number one complaint about Bitcoin. But guess what? That is also what is its saving grace because it is so hard to make these swooping changes and do these things that at this point it just runs as is. And there's really no CEO or governing body that is going to just basically at the flip of a switch decide to do some sort of merge and flip things over. No centralized foundation or whatever it might be. And I'm not knocking Ethereum. I, I really like Ethereum, don't get me wrong. But that sort of thing just does not happen on Bitcoin. And if you do your whole history on that, you can understand as to why that hard cap of 21 million, why it's so hard to really just orchestrate any sort of major change in all of these different things is why there's maxis. And for the most part, I would have to agree with them that Bitcoin is king and probably will be king. And I don't see anything ever overthrowing it with the exception of Satoshi just showing back up and saying, hey guys, guess what? I'm here and, you know, like blowing the whole cover off of the whole thing. But besides that happening, I don't necessarily think that anything's ever going to overtake Bitcoin in this whole crypto world. And we'll see. And that's not to say that anything else like Ethereum and these other chains, Polygon and these layer twos that are within the whole Ethereum ecosystem is not going to have value. No, that's not what I'm saying. But I just think that Bitcoin really is in a league of its own. It's Bitcoin and and everything else. And I was always like kind of uh, hesitant to use the word altcoin. And it's like, oh, well, that's so, you know, um, snobbish, right? Like altcoin, everything else, the alternatives to Bitcoin. But now I understand why even Ethereum is an altcoin. And, you know, it's although it's not a poo-poo coin, you know, it's still an altcoin. I understand that now. And I would almost say that I'm of the persuasion that if you're not taking your profit in Bitcoin or going back to whatever local currency that you are to actually spend it, then you really haven't taken any profits. I am sort of leaning towards that now because I think Bitcoin is as sound as it gets. 
And lastly, number 10, I will say business is business. Now, you might be wondering what exactly does that mean? Of course, this whole podcast, the Nifty Business Show or the NFT Business Show, however you want to pronounce it or read it, it is all about Web3 and how this technology is going to move us from speculation and actually implementing it into building great businesses, serving customers in a better way, and how all these technologies, whether it be these quirky PFP projects that we're playing with or trading cards or game pieces, whatever it might be, how is that going to really impact the real world? Well, no matter what kind of technology it is, whether it's the industrial revolution, the digital revolution, or what we're going through right now, going from web two to web three, or the web 2.5, whatever you want to call it, guess what? Businesses are still businesses. There's still customers, there's still needs to be served, and so forth. And for a business to stay in business, keep its door open, it has to have profits. So there has to be some sort of revenue model. These companies have to figure out how are they actually serving a purpose? What benefit are they offering? How are they going to generate? generate funds from that. Management is going to have to solve problems. They're going to have to come up with different things that are necessary to survive a changing landscape because not only are the customers, the environments, as far as the economics, but the actual technology itself is changing. So rather than saying, oh yeah, this is just such amazing tech and these upgrades and so forth. Well, no, these are actual people that you're serving and these are people running these companies. So when we're evaluating these projects, whether it be these communities that are offering all sorts of benefits and networking and so forth, or it is some sort of game or collectible. Well, how exactly is the management fulfilling all of this stuff? And it's going to come down to a lot of marketing as well, right? Marketing is very important. That is communicating all of this stuff to the audience, the people that are going to be making the purchases, if you will, the community members, the collectors, the investors, whatever it is. Marketing puts all this together in a way that communicates, that bridges that gap. So that not everyone has to be a coder or a full stack developer to understand what's going on here. They're just able to see the benefit, the problems that are being solved, and how it all comes together for their benefit. And of course, seeing the value in what, whatever price it is. That is all a part of marketing, and that is going to be going forward in Web3, a lot of people thought, well, no, all of that old stuff, marketing and influencers and all that stuff is not needed in Web3. No, well, trust me, it still is. Business is business. People are still people. And of course, in this whole thing, as we're seeing right now, I mean, businesses go through cycles. There are bull markets, there are bear markets, and in businesses, there are good times, there are bad times. There are times when it is slow, you know, depending on what type of business it is, certain times a year are a lot more profitable than other times a year. Or in the case of, let's say, some Something like a ski lift, right? Or a ski business. Well, if it is not a snowy season, well, guess what? That's going to impact the business. But then you're going to have years when there's just massive amounts of snow and it's absolutely ridiculous. And you're having, you know, three, four months extra of snow. So, I mean, again, cycles, things go up, things go down. There's good times, there's bad times. And this whole, like, you know, wag me, everything's going to the moon and everything's a rainbow and sunshines and there's nothing wrong in this space. Well, that whole thing just really went out the window and we're seeing right now that we're still dealing with people. We're still dealing with real world environments. We're not operating in a bubble. Wars break out, recessions, inflation, there's viruses. I mean, there's a lot of crazy things that happen and it's going to affect a business regardless of it's Web3 or not. And that's why it is great to have a long outlook, right? We're not talking about getting these 10 minute profits or instantly after minting, selling it for a three X return. I mean, that was unrealistic. That was just something that was great in the bull market. People had their fun, but guess what? That is not how a typical business environment operates. Just think about it. Like in what world do people start a business or whatever and expect to get an exit in 10 minutes? What we went through was definitely the signs of a bubble. And if we didn't learn that now, well, we definitely know it. So this whole space has not failed. This is still the beginning of things. Very bullish of this. My outlook has not changed. I love everything that's being built right here. And what we're going through right now is just a purging process. A lot of the craziness is getting washed out. And going forward, I'm more excited than ever before. But truthfully, when I get into something, I look at like a 10 year plan, right? So I did not necessarily think that it was just going to be amazing on day one. I'm pretty much restructuring my life in order to really dive into this stuff full time. And I understand Understand that this is a long play and that's no different in any other kind of business. It doesn't matter if I was starting a painting company or a car detailing business, a long-term outlook is definitely necessary for success. 
So hopefully you found value in those 10 lessons that I learned during this year, and I'm sure there are a lot more, but those are basically the categories where everything falls into. And I can definitely say I had an amazing year and going forward, as I said, lots of topics to cover, recapping and and really uh, doing uh, the outlook of where things are going, review some numbers. Of course, the fourth quarter numbers really has not come in yet to see where things are, but definitely we have a lot of content to cover and I'd love to know, what are your biggest lessons that you learned during this whole 2023 madness, the roller coaster, the ups and the downs? Please feel free to reach out to me at Tropic Vibes on Twitter. Love to hear your lessons. But as usual, I just want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this as we're learning and building Web3 together. So until next time, later. The Nifty Business Show is not investment advice. It provides insights and information within the space. As with anything, please do your own research before making a decision whether you're making an investment or a purchase.